This conversation would be incomplete without delving into ADA, the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority. We did invite Morgan Neff, CFO of ADA, to join us tonight, both to present and to be here for the question and answer period. Um, he declined the invitation. So our final presenter uh, before, before the break is Juno attorney Joe Geldof, who has agreed to help us understand this agency slash corporation slash bank a little better. Joe Geldof is a former assistant attorney general for the state of Alaska and has worked in private practice for municipalities, unions, other entities, and individuals for 40 years, and he's paid very close attention to ADA. So please help me welcome Mr. Joe Geldof. The most important thing really is listening to the questions that you have, and you've been talked at enough, and I'm not going to belabor this too long. Uh, I will give you some bald conclusions, and you can uh, press me for why I can come up with these conclusions. Um, am I an expert? No. Uh, the real experts up here, you, you just heard from one from the Yukon, uh, Greg Erickson. Guys certainly has a lot of experience. I have a lot of experience dealing with projects and developing them, some from the private side. And I'll say this, there's a lot of ideas for projects out there. In, in fact, there's a lot of good ideas. They're, they're almost a dime a dozen to use that old frame. But, but how putting them together, both the financing, the environmental, the community impacts is really, really difficult, which is why very few projects get out of the design phase. And all the cautionaries you heard, they're, they're valid. Uh, the, the statements you heard about whether or not you should be suspicious, fine. That'll, that'll work out. But one of the big things that I'm seeing here right now, I'm, I'm going to do a little trick. I want all of you to interact with me right now. This is corny, I know, but just bear with me. I like pretend like I'm Kreskin here. Okay. I'm thinking how many of you people here right here in this room night actually are against this mine as you know it right now. Okay. Give me your thoughts. Okay. I'm getting, Ooh, Oh, that's a little, longer. okay. I have a sense that about somewhere between 78 and 85% of the people sitting here tonight are actually against this mine. There's a few that are undecided and there's a few that are for it. I also have a sense because I did this before sort of with special powers that I have occasionally once a year. There was a big meeting here with the Chamber of Commerce and interesting enough about 85%, about the same percentage here that were against it were for the mine based on limited information, not really knowing anything about it. And my big observation right here, right now, and I'm just the guy from out of town, take it with a grain of salt. You're talking past each other. You know, it's a big problem in Haynes. It always has been. I love this community. I've been coming through here for 40 years. You know, I, I love the stories about, you know, we'd come back from playing hockey up in Haynes Junction or Whitehorse. I lost a tooth in Whitehorse. Okay. I remember those guys in Farrell. We used to play the Farrell miners up in Haynes Junction and Whitehorse. They were horrible people to play against. They were great people to drink beer with, but we drank beer with them. You know, the environmentalists on the team drank beer with the feral miners and everything. You got a big problem here where you're talking past each other, you're avoiding each other. Okay, so let me get down to Ada. And quickly, if there was ever a reason to have the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority it's kind of in the, the mists of time where we didn't have enough capital in Alaska. And, but for the lack of capital and all those horrible bankers down there in Seattle where they have the money or San Francisco where they have the big money or New York where they got the gigantic money, they just won't let us thrive here. Okay, that's an old story in the North. That's a story all over the North, all over supposedly underdeveloped things. So what did we do? Well, we set up the Alaska industrial development and export authority because they'll have the real money to free up you know our people and everything. Interesting enough, same arguments made for the Alaska Housing Authority and other kind of quasi-governmental or public private entities. If we just had a little money, we'd we'd all be rich. We'd all be better. You know, even guys like me, we'd have hard abs, you know, all the women would be beautiful, the whole thing, you know. But is it true? Here's the thing about finance, at least in 2021. Good ideas 
with a sound business plan, you can get, there is so much money available and you can wire it from Singapore or New York or the Middle East or any number of places where people can review plans, see if they make sense and finance them. Now I'll give you my conclusions and you can say I'm full of it or not, but you know, the time where we really needed the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority is probably long gone. It is a self-perpetuating bureaucracy that has basically become a political slush fund run by political hacks. Um, the, the morale at the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority is horrible. They take positions in projects all over our state using public money that don't make sense. The DeLong Mountain Road is the one bright shining example where there was the one of the world's biggest zinc and other metallic uh, ores, where it actually penciled out. It was close enough to Tidewater uh, on a route where you can get the, the ore, the partially concentrated ore to the, to the Orient uh, to refine, that actually has penciled out more or less. Um, I think one of the presenters said, yeah, there are some environmental problems and indeed there are. Um, it doesn't help that the state of Alaska, the Department of Environmental Conversation, kind of is lackadaisical about any enforcement, including up on the DeLong Mountain Road. But those are issues that we just have to live with. Almost all of the other projects, and not just the port projects, that the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority have funded have been dubious or, or horrible. Um, you know, Greg Erickson was charitable. He talked about a couple of the port projects. You, you could go down the list and there's reports being compiled now that will lay out in great detail the mendacious investment strategy of ADA over the years. But, you know, everybody's favorite kind of, at least up in Anchorage, is the big fish processing plant, which almost everybody's heard about, which turned out to be not such a good idea. Now there's a very large mega church in there. Um, Ada at its best, and, and could, should we have a funding mechanism to support small and, and medium-sized businesses? We probably should. But there are examples of if you want to build a brewery in Haines or Anchorage or any place else, and you've got half the capital and you've raised all the money you can and you've got a great business plan and the banks are going to give you another, you know, the, the last 40% of your money, Ada could come in and provide that last little thing to get things over the top. There's probably a role for that, but I'm going to wind up now because you don't need anybody talking at you and just give you my bald conclusion based on some experience and a lot of observation and a lot of consultation with people who have worked for years watching Ada. Like, and I'll invoke my friend Rick Halford, who loved development when he was in the legislature. He has come to the conclusion that you could take all of the assets that Ada has under the control and that they try to invest, which is really your money, the public's money. You could take a pallet out and burn it and it would do less damage, just burning it and taking them out of the business of investing in Canadian mining companies. And it would be better off for the state of Alaska because they have a nearly unbroken record of financing odd, peculiar projects that are not consistent with community values. So that's a conclusion, take it or leave it. But do you need development in this town? Yeah, and you get it. I mean, who among us is not impressed with some of the things that you've done on your own? Um, good luck. But one of the things is you have absolutely got to start listening and talking to each other because you've got people in this community who are deeply invested in this community as much as any of you who think this project is somehow going to be the salvation for them or their kids. And I'll just end by saying my experience goes to Haynes, goes back to 1980. And I worked with Dave Klein and the Audubon Society in creating the Chilcat Bald Eagle Preserve. It's just something that I was supposed to do, so I did it. And I didn't realize at the time how significant, I mean, it's a tremendous resource. But all of a sudden people came from all over the world because you created a preserve here. The most interesting thing of all, the people that fought myself and other people who were advocates, I mean, we were even working with Bill Ray. 
who is not considered a huge environmentalist because it's such a world-class thing. The people who fought against this the most were the ones that immediately saw an opportunity to monetize the tours and everything. Now, that doesn't make them bad people. And it doesn't make me a great guy because I worked on that project. But later or sooner, all of us have got to work together. And it's not just all development or all preservation. And I wish you the very best, but I wouldn't trust the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority to do diligence. They don't even follow their statutes. They're getting sued for failure, repeated failures for Open Meetings Act. It's run like a, it's a political slush fund run by political appointees who have no idea how to get a reasonable rate of return on your money. Thank you. All right, here's Guy to help us field questions. So let's, uh, you know, I hope that this discussion is gonna prompt further discussions. And, and uh, I think the message that, that the community needs to, to uh, talk to each other instead of past each other is absolutely the correct uh, way of going about any of this. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so we're just gonna open it up for questions and I'll, I'll just point because I don't know everybody. So, so um, based on the website, so they're self-funded, they're an SFP, AA credit rating, they have this history of boondoggling projects. How are they still viable? I think Greg will take that question for the people on Zoom. The question is that Ada has a good credit rating, double A, and so how are they not a viable organization? Well, they are a viable organization. They've been in existence for well, probably 50 years now. And uh, the state continues to pour money in. Uh, they have assets, net assets, worth 800, over $800 million. Now, if you invest those, even at low interest rates, that provides a constant flow of money that is used to meet their various missions. That's the answer. I hope that makes sense to you because it seems to me that's why they still remain a viable organization is that they have this huge pile of money that is your money, my money, and they use it for the purposes that the legislature established. Does that make sense? So it is very clever in the political arena. Like they've got this great thing. Every year they announce we're paying a dividend to the legislature and the legislature goes, wow, we're going to get money back. And they give them like $17 million or something. And everybody goes, wow. $17 million. As a payout on $875 million invested by the people of Alaska. So, you know, I'm a lawyer. Typically, we're not very good on math, but $17 million on a $800 million, I don't know, it doesn't seem like that great of a return. But interesting enough, the politicians, they always, they always go, great, we got a dividend. And if you say, well, can we appropriate any of that $800 million? Because last time I checked, there's a lot of people looking for money to pay for this or that and everything. And they're really skillful, Ada is, at sort of saying, oh, no, oh, no, no, you can't touch that. You know, it's tied up in this and we need this for the, for the reserves here and the credit rating. And they've got all this really clever, and, and it's, I really mean it, it's clever and it's good, mumbo jumbo that they fend off any request to, to touch any of their money, which is one of the reasons I say it's run like a political slush fund by a bunch of political hacks. And they're good hacks. So. So, well, so, well, hold on a sec. For the great patient people on Zoom, I'm going to move the microphone around so they can hear the questions. We had a hand up back here first. So I'll hit back here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rob Goldberg. I've been a planning commissioner here since the city and borough consolidated in 2002. The planning commission has provided a forum for people to talk to each other, not past each other. Over the years, we've been able to solve quite a few problems for the community. Uh, I've been proud of that. Um, I have concerns about this project. The Planning Commission saw this, I think, two months ago at our meeting. And as was mentioned here, phase four was just a rectangle on the map. It's like, what is this? What's going to happen here? There was really no information. 
So I'm really glad I came tonight because I've learned a lot. Uh, and I thank you very much for, for the presentation. But my question is, if Haynes goes ahead with this and takes out a $30 million loan from ADA, 3.5% interest, and as we've heard from Mr. Rifkin from the Yukon, no one comes to use our facility here and to pay it off. What happens when a community defaults on an ADA loan? So I'll, I'll do one correction and pardon me, Greg. The actual movie quote is, if you build it, he will come, one person. <laughs> but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and, and who's the one person? <laughs> it was his father. Oh. <laughs> well, um, Ada has had defaults. And typically, they get bailed out by, um, <laughs> by um, the state. And uh, or they contrive accounting um, stratagems which uh, cover up the bailout. Um, and um, I don't know what happened in Valdez with respect to the $10 million bonds that they themselves issued and that never uh, materialized in a way of any income. But that would be an interesting question to uh, follow up on. So here's a real world example which is not the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, but what happens when a community says, wow, this is going to be great. And the industry says, it'll be fantastic. But we just need a little help with the infrastructure. Okay, Mobile, Alabama, right there on the Gulf. Cruise ships floating all around and everything. People can see cruise ships. Wow, we can be selling fudge, T-shirts, beer, you know, tours, everything. It'll be great. Mobile signs up to build a dock and they bond it. They're on the hook for that. Somebody in Miami says, eh, Mobile is not that great. You know, let's go to Key West and, uh, you know, other places and everything. We're not coming there. The people of Mobile are on the hook for the bonded indebtedness to build the dock. You know, they can try to run a sulfur ship there, you know, and reconvert it and have a, maybe, maybe they could make an ore terminal there or something. But, you know, it, it's potentially a disaster. And, are there potential upsides? Sure. But those are exactly the kind of questions that you need to be asking. And, and Guy's point about, you know, you can tell the difference between a sales pitch and a real pitch. I'll go back to my thing. Good ideas are a dime a dozen. The devil is in the details. It's in the financing. Anytime somebody comes and says, we just need a little help with the financing of infrastructure, and there's a long payout before you get the return, what guarantees are you going to get? You know, is Mickey Harrison going to do a personal guarantee on, on the mobiles doc, uh, not so much. Is Carnival? No, not so much. Um, usually the public, as Greg said, is the last person standing. And you know you got to go to Jonathan Christ Tompkins or Bill Thomas, whoever you like, and say, geez, this didn't work out. Can you help us out a little bit? And you know maybe they come up with the money and let you off the hook. But there's always bankruptcy, too. Uh Puerto Rico, as the entire um, Commonwealth, is basically bankrupt. And um, so far, they, it has not been good for the citizens of that, of that US territory because their power is continuing to fail and so forth. Yeah, that little town I mentioned before from the oil shale projects, um, they're on the hook, a town of 600 people paying for a water treatment plant for 6,000 people. I think you had a yeah. question behind you, though, too. That one up there for you guys. Okay. Yes. Right. I, I just kind of have a follow up crowd question to the state of the state and the appropriations. The legislature does not necessarily make annual appropriations, but almost every year they do. If you look at ADA's balance or uh, revenue statement, they have several entries that are. If you if you look past the verbiage, are actually money from the legislature. They call it capital contributions. Uh, uh, I forget the other the other names they call them, but typically it's about the same amount as the ADA dividend too. So are you aware of any uh, cases where ADA had to be bailed out, and a community in Alaska suffered? similar fate that you discussed in Alabama or wherever. Are there instances of this? Um, 
I'm actually involved in a project that is examining that, that very question and others. Um, and I cannot give you, I don't know the, uh, if there is uh, an exact analog. I suspect there is, but I, but I can't cite it. Joe, do you know? Uh, you know not offhand, but the, the opacity of ADA is such that a number of people in Alaska came together and said, you know, there's all these anecdotal horror stories. So let's have some people do a project, which is underway right now. The, the thing that I find will, will be very curious about is do facts and, and analysis really matter in the political context? Um, that's an open question and, and probably betrays my great cynicism. But when you have an $800 you know, million dollar slush fund going on, you have all kinds of vested interests, including the banks, who basically a lot of risks for bankers is taken out of the equation, the loan equation, by the Alaska Industrial Development Authority. Um, so this public entity has been captured, basically, is my view. Uh, and, and I admit I'm very cynical um, by vested interest. And they know what they're doing. They make sure the people appointed to run ADA uh, reflect their interest, not necessarily yours which is one of the reasons why a number of people have actually talked about proposing a, an initiative, a statewide initiative to basically wind down ADA's affairs and have the legislature reconstitute a new development authority that is targeted on small and medium, and there's a definition problem there, enterprises, the kind of things like, you wanna start a brewery? Fine, we'll help you out a little bit if you get a bunch of your capital and you borrow some and you're on the hook for that. But, but this business of loaning large tranches of money to Canadian mining companies to build a road that will, you know, I mean, the big thing, and it's, it's almost laughable, it's there'll be jobs. I mean, jobs is invoked like a mantra, jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, what does that mean? Jobs for outside miners, jobs for outside loggers, jobs for the kids who are graduating from Haynes High School next year. Um, there's a lot of people who have kind of gotten the feel that ADA is not the be all end all that was its promise and they want it reconstituted if not eliminated. Um, but that's exactly what Greg and a number of his colleagues are studying. And when you get that report, I just hope that it doesn't wind up gathering dust on, on shelves and that people actually use it to reformulate the industrial development and the business development money that belongs to you. Actually, uh, just a couple of comments uh, to flesh out a little bit of a couple of the stories. Uh, one, uh, what Joe was talking about with the uh, Mobile, Alabama, uh, the community bonded itself for $26 million to build that uh, cruise ship dock. And with the promise that Carnival was going to uh, home port a ship there, and they did for one year. And then they decided it was going to make more sense to move the ship to home port in New Orleans. And, and that was the end of that. So that was one. And I wanted to make a comment on something the guy said. I've been involved, as probably some of you know, in looking at uh, DEC permits for a long, long time. And to my knowledge, uh, could be wrong, but as far as I know, DEC has never turned down a permit application for a wastewater discharge permit for surface waters. Never. They, as Guy said, they work to the sit to get to yes. They'll they'll modify things, but they have never said, you know what, this makes no sense. This is just so poorly designed, we're not going to go there. They should have done it this last time with uh, with the uh, plan of operations, the poo two from Constantine, but they couldn't even go there for that with that groundwater discharge permit. They've never, they've never done it in all the history of the uh, agency. And I would add that they don't really enforce anything either. With Kensington, over a period of five years, they had continuous effluent violations, over 200 reporting violations, using the wrong methods, not sampling, on and on. It was EPA Region 10 that eventually stepped in and, and forced a compliance agreement, DEC, did not act in that entire time. Yeah, thank you. 
And I want to thank Lynn Canal Conservation. I've been to all your mining forums and it's been informative. Uh, my name is Fred Gray. Um, I've been on the Ports and Harbors Committee for 10, 11 years. Um, I look around the room and I've maybe only seen one person in the last 10 years in this room that's been to any of our meetings. Uh, we've never had a Constantine member or employee, not even Liz, uh, come to our meetings. And we've de definitely not had Ada. But I've worked on that dock. I mean, I'm a local. You guys know. Um, these guys haven't probably even been on the dock, all due respect. But uh, I worked barges for 26 years in that dock. And I saw, almost tripped in a two-meter uh, sinkhole off the dock. The state took uh, one of the 40-foot round um, support uh, steel barriers, and they took all the rocks out of it and collapsed inward. So the dock is catastrophic, and something has to be done. And I know this has been, you know, a mining, uh, you know, more a forum for mining than it is for our dock, but you couldn't put, and, and I'm, they're talking phase four of our plan, for the city, I'm talking phase one. You couldn't put, you can't put logs on that dock. We barely have room for containers and uh, and heavy equipment, stuff moves in and out. And dear, near and dear to my heart that comes into our little dock, and it is a little dock, is Alaska Amber Beer comes in every week. So I want to protect that dock. And so we, we as a community have to do something. If Ada's willing to loan us money to fix the dock, but I mean, you you can have a fleet of lawyers say, okay, but we're not looking at an ore terminal. And and common sense, you guys, you guys all drive out there. There's no room for an ore terminal. I've been to the ore terminal in Skagway. It's huge. And it's, yeah. And so I know the history of Yukon mining because I worked up there for 15 years for an oil company. And, and, and I know most of the, the problems that Skagway has had. And I, I think we look at phase four, which we're talking about tonight, mostly is 20 years off in our committee. So are we kicking the can down the road? Possibly. And yeah, the debate is Constantine or the Japanese could come in and, and talk us into a, a ore terminal next year. But I just don't see it in the near future. But it is a concern of all of us. So, and thanks for that time, by the way. <laughs> I want to say the Haynes Dock is very important to me. I asked my wife to marry me there, and she said she'd think about it. And I think that's a, the entirely exactly the, the conversation the community needs to have, what's best for the community, what they need now and not think about future risks and this and that. I mean... You know, do the simple first or simpler, not that that's what I'm saying. I would just add just to block. To the point, you know, good political operators actually have a ratio. It's about three times easier to stop a project than it is to advance it. So you got to ask yourself are you going to put your life resources, your time, your energy, whatever, into blocking something? Where's the satisfaction in that? If you can find common ground, with people who want some development and you all decide that you need development here. I mean, easy for me to say as an outsider, but you'd best find that common ground and work together or you're gonna perpetuate what's going on in this community and in my community of Juneau and all over the United States. We separate into tribes and we know what we don't want and we take turns savaging each other. And if you can find common ground, you'll be a better, happier community and you'll actually get something out of it instead of a bunch of bitter feelings that you can wash down at the fog cutter. Thank you. Yeah, so a follow up to my previous question and, and to Fred's too, is that we do need to fix the dock. You know, at, at one meeting I described our community as an organism. And at the time we were looking at this catastrophic failure of the face of the dock we were also having big problems with our sewage treatment plant. And I said, if our town were an organism, we'd be in real trouble because the place where we take in our food and the place where we eliminate that food are both in trouble right now. 
And if we don't fix them both, the community is going to die. And so we did manage to put a fix on the sewage treatment plant. And now we have to address the stock. So the planning commission doesn't deal with money. That's the assembly's job. But I just want to try to get some information here. If you know, this, this aid alone seems kind of scary to me. Um, you know, this idea of paying for the loan with user fees, just it, that doesn't seem likely um, with what we heard tonight. But we do need to put a fix on our dock so that we can get our freight in and out. And I don't think that it's going to require a $30 million fix. I think that was the price to, to fix the entire face of the dock. Um, but are there other alternatives besides ADA for a community like ours to get some money to, to fix our dock? That's my question. I can answer that. Ask the kid, ask our that, I can answer that. Ask the kid, ask our that, and then we have a team that's step in and wait for that. But you're jeopardizing lives. Like my own that was out on that dock. Yeah. So I'd like to hear from Mr. Harrison. Uh, what are the possibilities for flooding? Uh, well, I think that maintaining uh, marine freight access uh, to Alaska's communities should be one of the highest priorities of ADA. Um, I think they're more motivated right now by uh, other factors, their balance sheet, for example, um, and the problem of maintaining that asset on their balance sheet that's now in Skagway. Um, I don't know the history of the, of the failed attempts to gain federal or state or other funding. So I'm really not competent to answer that question. But I have read that there is a roll-on, roll-off facility that is operative, uh, that doesn't depend or is, I guess, adjacent to the uh, LUTAC dock. Um, but uh, I'm sorry. I'm not going to try to answer a question that I'm really not competent or haven't done the background research to answer. So we have a question from the Zoom audience. Um, Ron Jackson is asking, I wonder what the annual payments are on a loan of $30 million for 3.5% interest that Haynes will be making payments on with, the on with only the revenues from the users, currently only two. Seems like it would not be possible. I kind of assume that would uh, depend on the, the, the length of the loan. As well, could you? Well, and and the interest rate. We don't know what it's going to be, or what other um, codicils or other circumstances are going to be appended to it. Um, the uh, it's an easy calculation to make, but I haven't made it, and I'm not going to uh, try to answer it on the seat of my pants or on the fly. Well, and how you get, even if some everybody's talking about three point five. You're not going to get a 3.5 rate lock based on discussions in, in the media and people basically spitballing an idea that there's no business plan, that there's no user agreement in place, everything. You know, we've been printing money in the United States of America to beat the band here. And the likelihood that inflation is cooking up is somewhat high. If you could get a rate lock on 3.5, to do exactly what you need to fix the dock, to keep the goods moving into this community, you might take it. But what's the scope of the plan here? What, what's really trying to do? And you got a whole lot of people with an agenda that's not necessarily consistent with making sure groceries wind up at houses and you know, into your community. And those are things you're gonna have to sweat out. But again, I keep returning back, find that common ground with the people who want some development. And, narrow the scope to exactly what this community needs and don't be running an agenda that's based in Japan or, you know, anywhere else or, or even Anchorage with the Alaska Industrial Development Export Authority. So. We'll do another Zoom question here and then go back to the room. Uh, it's kind of a statement. Any bond will need to go to the voters as the cruise dock did. It must be clear what we are paying for. 
Um, I'm not sure what the city politics, but would a bond have to go to the voters for consent? Well, if it's a general obligation bond, it must, by constitutional provision, go to the voters. Yeah. If it's a revenue bond, doesn't necessarily have to, but then interest rate is not going to be 3.5%, I would guess. Um, if, if, you put, if you simply take 3.5% of $30 million, that's about a little over a million dollars a year. I don't know whether the uh, Haynes Freight uh, business would absorb that much at all. I, I suspect not. Um, Tom Morfitt, um, I can't help but draw parallels between this project and I think the $30 million price tag is drawn in the environmental community with an assumption that this kind of commitment can be only be some kind of promissory note for the mining community. But I compare it to our um, downtown harbor, another $30 million project. Um, we spent, I think, close to $30 million there, and we haven't added one more slip. And um, so um, I would just encourage people to perhaps consider maybe this is not the borough assembly um, trying to set up a mine at Constantine as it is some um, in fact, the way that the borough proposed this stock was four part was to go right to the 30 million. The, at the last meeting, the borough decided to cut it in half between phase one and two and phases three and four. Um, but I would uh, encourage people to uh, not necessarily see this through an environmental lens, but through a lens of kind of a grandiosity on the part of the Ports and Harbors Committee and other people who dreamed, wow, wouldn't it be great to have a great, a big dock and we could get all the freight from Canada in here and whatnot. But when you look at the actual economics, the dock will be bringing in less, about $300,000 a year from Fred's company or Fred's former company and the, uh, and the um, freight company. And when you look at paying back $30 million at $300,000 a year in revenue, it's, it's a long haul. But I, you know, I, I think unfortunately the community um, only really gets alarmed uh, oftentimes at the prospect of some sinister giant industrial development when um, in fact our concern should be um, that we sometimes um, our, was it our eyes are a lot bigger than our stomachs when it comes to these projects. And for half, for if we built half the uh, steel wall down there at the harbor that we did, we could have slips in there and actually have economic development in our harbor. We, if we have a giant parking lot, we have a giant wall, we haven't added any new slips and we spent $30 million. I, I submit that basically this project might be much more uh, akin to that project. And sorry for taking up all this time. Yeah, I, I had another comment here based on kind of what, on what Fred, what you were saying and, and, uh, and Tom, where you were going with this too, in a way. Um, I think one of the issues here, Fred, I don't, I don't think that, I think you would find very, very few people in this town and, and I'll include myself that, would be against uh, ensuring that we can get freight and uh, fuel into town. I think we all, I, I think almost virtually everyone agrees that that is a priority for the town. We have the roll on roll off now. Okay. And I, and I've talked to uh, Mike Denker and I talked to Mike Ganey and, and I know that their concern is that five years from now or 10 years, whenever at some point, part of the dock that we have now that they need to tie up the barge uh, to be able to continue to bring freight and fuel in town is, is suspect. And I understand that. And I'm totally supportive of fixing that situation. And I think that most people are. I think that what's, I think what's been a disservice to the town is that instead of looking at phase one, phase two, and possibly even just phase two, as being necessary things for the town, for making sure we can get fuel and and, uh, and food into town, by by describing it rhetorically as phases one, two, three, and four, 
what it's done is it's it's raised concerns for people that you have this plan. And I don't say you, I, I meant the, the grand you, uh, that there is this plan for getting from here to there. And the phase four part of the plan has been to perhaps build an ore terminal up on the other side of the, the road or wherever. I don't think that it's been good for the community for those two things to be put into the same uh, package. We should have been talking about, let's fix the dock, call it phase two, or you can call that phase one, whatever you want to do. And there's our pro there's a project. Now we have another project. Do we want to build an ore terminal? We should never have, I don't know who came up with it, but it should never have been described as a phase one through phase four, because there is just an implication that once you get down that road and you start getting money, this is where we're going to end up eventually. So I just think that from a public uh, perception uh, perspective, I think that that was a mistake. And I, I don't know, I'd like to see the borough assembly or the Ports and Harbors Committee. And I have been to some of your meetings by Zoom um, recently, um, but I'd like to see that addressed. Maybe if we separated these things out, we'd find that in fact, 99% of the people agree with you that the freight and fuel has to be guaranteed. I'm there, you know, we need to fix that. Well, it's uh, after 9.30, um, maybe time for one more. I hate to cut off the discussion because this is all very, this is exactly what needs to happen. And, and uh, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, willing to stay as long as necessary, but um, anybody else, anybody Zoom, raise the hand or put it in chat or, or oh, we got, yeah, one more. Um, yeah, I just, I want to, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and for um, engaging in this discussion and I hope we can continue. Um, and I, you know, for me personally, uh, having waded through tons of documents about what, it, you know, what other projects like this have been like and, and the cost and the cost of communities and whatnot, um, I just, I guess I have two things I'd like to say about this project. And one is, you know, I appreciate Fred Gray being here and, and saying what he had to say. And I, I think it's true that none of us would argue with the need to fix the dock, to keep people safe, to keep freight going in and out of our community um, based on our, our real needs and the needs of the people and the businesses that are here. Um, but I think what we're missing is a fiscally conservative, fiscally responsible, um, minimalist version. You know, usually when you have a you have a project proposal, you have different versions, you know, here's the cheapest, easiest idea. And here's, you know, if we want to get fancy, we'll do this and we'll do this. And then, you know, on the far other side, there would be the um, super expensive ultra industrial development. And I just, um, I know this, this $30 million price tag has been thrown around, but I just want to, for perspective, um, read this. Um, so this is the, the Ada and Tech in 1986. So Tech is the owner of Red Dog Mine. Ada and Tech signed a 50-year loan agreement with a 6.5% interest rate. Um, Ada financed the building of the 52-mile dedicated gravel haul road from the mine to the Pacific Ore Port for an initial cost of $160 million. This is in 1986. In 1990, the port was upgraded, bringing the investment to $245 million. Tech pays about $15 million per year in interest on the loan and will be paying it off until 2040. So a comparison for us might be if the nearby community of Kotzebue, population 3000, tried to take out a loan to build the infrastructure for the Red Dog Mine, um, as Haynes is considering doing. So, you know, if you consider in 1986, they, they, it took 160 million. We, know, we all know how expensive it is to build stuff these days. Um, that four phase plan only gets us to phase three. They only describe, they only give a cost estimate for phase three. They don't even, 
they don't even, all they give us is a, is a polygon for phase four. There's no cost estimate, even though phases one through four um, will be, uh, they'll do the planning and permitting for phases one through four in phase one. So that's their plan. And that's, that's what concerns me is the idea that, that these things are tied together and that once we um, make a deal to get the money that we're on this road that takes us it, it bonds us to ADA, which is a dubious organization, according to, you know, some people who know more than I do. And, and it, it, might, it might be a dangerous path for our community to be on. And I think, you know, I've talked to our, with our legislators and they say we could get the money from infrastructure, money from, you know, capital improvement projects, but they want to see us get it under 10 million. And then they say it's doable. And so, as a community, I think we should be talking about a fiscally responsible, res responsible, minimalist version that we could get done so we can keep people safe and keep our businesses running. And that's, you know, just me speaking. Um, again, thank you so much for all your time and effort and thoughts and let's keep working on it. We have another question from the Zoom audience. This one from Liz Cornejo. I have a question for Joe, who was involved with the Audubon Society as one of the parties of the 1982 Haines Consensus that formed both the Bald Eagle Preserve and the Haines State Forest through statute. Conservation and mining and logging interest found consensus then. What does talking with each other rather than talking past each other look like to help this bounce continue? People who talk with each other, first of all, they listen. I mean, you have, you know, the old saying about you, you have two ears and one mouth, and that's about the right ratio they should be used. You know, you should listen about twice as much as you talk, um, including me, so I'll make it short. Um, as I think back on how we found some common ground, and I, I was not one of the major dumb ones. I was a player in that, and but I remember distinctly <coughs> We kept talking about what's the purpose and the need for, for what we were trying to do. And, and there's different orientations there. But if you, if you can find the common ground before you even get into the finance, and I, I believe in conservative financing, the predicate to finding finance is to find the purpose and the need. If, what are we trying to do? And then how can we get that done usually follows. But if you focus in on the purpose and need for moving freight here, You'll find you'll you'll find it'll automatically be right sized to a degree that then the engineers can do it. If if you just go out and say, "Wow, we need to rebuild the the Lutec dock," and you talk to an engineering firm, and that's the danger here is your assembly will start spending. You know, oh, it's only a hundred thousand dollars to do the pre-engineering work. Okay, G guess who loves that? Somebody in Juneau or somebody in Anchorage that do the pre-engineering work and then the engineering work. Okay. If it doesn't match up with the purpose and the need of your community, you're just shipping money out of this community. And maybe it came from JKT or whatever, a Tiger grant or from the federal government. But if you can nail down that question, and that's what we did, I think, back in the early 80s, what's the purpose of those eagles and, and, and the need? And there were, there were some logging elements. And that's when John Schnabel was alive. And, you know, Bill Ray's always, you know, waving his molloquial eye on me and saying, you know, you're just a, something environmentalist. And I said, well, yeah, guilty as charged, I guess. But that was just a test from an old World War II sailor to see if I was okay and could hang with him. And eventually, Bill Ray, who was the senator for Haines then, and all these disparate groups found the common purpose and said, there really is a need to do this. And we got on with it. If you don't do purpose and need, you'll just be in the talking past each other, you know, and you'll be drinking at your, you know, you'll be drinking something expressos at mountain market and the rest of the people up at the fog cutter are saying drinking Rainier are just saying, they're all just a bunch of hippies who are trustafarians or whatever. And that's not good for any of you. So purpose and need, I think that's, does that make sense? usually where every NEPA action starts. That's the purpose of need. Well, um, that's it on uh, Zoom questions. Still, uh, going once, going twice.
Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for putting up with my weird metaphors and side conversations about dog bags and stuff. And I appreciate that. And, uh, and uh, thank you, Lynn Canal Conservation, for posting all this and the Haines Center and KHNS and, and everybody who uh, showed the patience and is uh, no doubt dedicated to doing the hard work that's going to be necessary to find that consensus and, and get what's right for the town and avoid risk and, and uh, 